Although the APA would operate substantial facilities on Puget Sound and in southeast Alaska, its biggest enterprise was focused on the enormous red salmon fisheries of Bristol Bay. This was the remotest corner of American industry. Success in a region like this demanded a company with size, a company with capital, a company with manpower, a company with ships. The star of Alaska and Finland to lay in Bristol Bay till the summer. The APA had the size and the capital, and labor was cheap. All it lacked were ships. Immediately, the Packers began acquiring the hulls required to operate salmon canneries in a far off wilderness. A lot of them were what was popularly called a down easter or a, a four rig ship built in the post clipper era in New England. There were lots of them on the West Coast that were living out their lives out here in the lumber trade. But they were suitable for the cannery trade because they were boat carriers. And they could put lots of fishermen on board as transports. Around the world, ship owners were replacing their sailing ships with steam-powered vessels that carried cargo faster. Sailing ships could no longer be operated at a profit. But the Alaska Packers didn't need profits from the shipping trade, nor were they concerned with speed. Their business was salmon, and their product was non-perishable. They wanted floating storehouses, capable of carrying men and supplies north each spring, and of hauling the canned pack home to San Francisco in the fall. It was a buyer's market for sailing ships, and the Alaska Packers were buying. It seemed these venerable relics of an earlier age were ideal for the Alaska salmon trade. Well, in the first place, they were laid up probably six months out of the year. You didn't need a lot of engineers on a sailing ship. They spent their winter months laid up at the company's basin in Alameda, at Fortman Basin, at the foot of Peru Street in Alameda. And they, uh, uh, were just idle, empty ships for maybe six months out of the year. A steamer costs money to maintain. You got engines to maintain. On sailing ships, you don't. The original wooden down easters were hard workers, but sailing ships made from iron and steel were larger, more durable, and at the turn of the century, readily available on the world market. The association bought its first iron ship, the Euterpe, in January of 1901. Soon, there would be more. The Alaska Packers fleet was one of the largest sailing ship fleets in America and probably the very largest that included the kind of ships they had, square rig ships. Uh, what they used to say, they had the biggest privately owned sailing fleet in the world, privately owned. As the Packers shop for bigger and better vessels, a fleet of iron and steel ships, several of them British-built, had fetched up in a port of convenience, Honolulu. Then as now, foreign-built hulls were barred from U.S. commercial fisheries in the coastwise trade. But the 1898 annexation of Hawaii and a subsequent act of Congress changed the rules. Soon, a more imposing fleet lined the wharves at Fortman Basin. There were four particular ships that came out of one fleet in Ireland, in Belfast, called the, uh, uh, the, the Irish Stars, owned by J.P. Corey. They were the Star of Bengal, the Star of Russia, the Star of France, and the Star of Italy. The Packers liked the Corey Star prefix, and began naming all of their sailing ships after the fashion of the Irish vessels. The Euterpe became the Star of India. The Balclutha became the Star of Alaska. The Himalaya became the Star of Peru. The Koalinga became the Star of Chile. And the Abbey Palmer became the Star of England. The Great Star Fleet was born. 
So eventually, 19 iron and steel sailing ships replaced the old wooden ships. And these ships were more easily convertible to carrying cannery hands, larger cargoes of supplies, and larger packs coming back from Alaska at the end of the season. To crew the Starfleet and another 10 to 15 sailing vessels under charter, the APA employed more than 7,000 men. Its vessels packed 75,000 tons of cargo annually. Every April, the ships were loaded with coal to fuel the canneries, with tin to make the cans, with lumber to construct cannery buildings and wharfs, with box shooks to make the salmon cases, and with a summer's worth of provisions. Once the stores were loaded in Alameda, the vessels were towed to San Francisco, where crews representing the far corners of the globe signed on for the 2,500-mile trip north. The masters of these ships were largely all Scandinavian. There were some Germans. Italians and Scandinavians signed on as sailors and fishermen. In the spring, they helped rig the ships and sail them north. After the fishing and canning were finished in the fall, they loaded the holes with a salmon pack and sailed the ships home. As compensation, they received run money, $75 for the run north, paid after the vessel had reached Alaska, and $75 more for the return voyage, paid at the dock in Alameda. And they paid them in runs, I was told, to keep them from deserting. Communication aboard the polyglot vessels was a challenge. Niceties like proper names were often dispensed with. Nobody knew what their first names were. Sometimes they didn't know what their last names were. They just went by a handle. King Sam and Pete, Daylight Jack was Captain Soline, who had the Star of Italy for many years. I met him in 1943 in Alameda. I met uh, King Sam and Pete in his last years when he was way up in his 80s living in Alameda. I met Captain Halverson walking up and down the office of the old Alaska Packers office over at 111 California Street. He looked like the, he looked like the uh, San Francisco Mafia, felt hat squashed down over his head overcoat, a real gruff guy, but what a man he was, and what a character, and what a driver of men he was on that ship in Malkutha, with the Star of Alaska. <laughs>